Muito boa tarde, good afternoon everyone, and welcome to our first of four different parts to this colloquium uh, commemorating in the bicentennial of Brazil's independence. On behalf of California State University Fresno and the Portuguese Beyond Borders Institute uh, that I'm honored to direct at Fresno State, uh, and of course on behalf of California State University Stanislaus and uh, the uh, Portuguese Language Program and Professor Renato Alvin, we want to welcome each and every one of you uh, to this event, to the first of uh, four different parts of this colloquium, as we said, uh, commemorating the bicentennial of uh, Brazil, the largest Portuguese speaking country in the world, and certainly uh, one of the uh, powerhouses, uh, both culturally, economically, and politically, uh, not just in South America, but in this hemisphere and throughout the world. Um, we want to welcome uh, other students. We will want to welcome those who are following us also um, through the various social media outlets. And as always, all of the events that uh, we put forth at the Portuguese Beyond Borders Institute, PBBI, at Fresno State, uh, these will be archived at the Fresno State Library as part of the Portuguese Oral History Collection. Um, because indeed history is being made every single day, not just something that happened uh, when our grandparents or great grandparents uh, were alive. And so I'm going to turn it over to Professor Renato Alvin. I want to thank the uh, guests that are with us. Uh, we're very fortunate to have and we'll, they'll all be introduced. Um, and I want to thank Renato um, for uh, embarking on this journey as uh, in many cases throughout the California State University system, we have 23 campuses, but it seems like everybody does its own thing. Um, and uh, in the Portuguese speaking community, we need to think more of uh, as a Portuguese speaking community and less as countries, uh, whether they be in uh, South America, Europe, uh, Africa, or Asia. And so I appreciate Renato for his courage and for his uh, uh, and for his commitment to this program, and hopefully it will just be the first of many that we will do collaboratively with California State University, Stanislaus, our neighbor here to the north. Thank you, Denise, and uh, I would like to thank you all uh, and welcome you, um, authorities, um, prof professionals, colleagues, and friends, and, um, and especially Professor Denise, who, um, for inviting me to collaborate with these celebrations, um, as he has always been a supporter of our Portuguese programs and advocating to keep us alive and visible. Um, and uh, as you know, as you might know, the CSU system has about half a, half a million students, 500,000 students. It, it's the largest public university system in the US. And also I'd like to thank the, the Portuguese Beyond Borders Institute for also supporting us. And um, also to remind you that um, we are going to have four days of celebrations and uh, Professor Denise later on um, will um, bring more details about it. And um, thank you everybody. Thank you, Denise. And um, I would like to invite now my colleague, uh, Dr. Uh, Rachel Mamilla Fernandez and invite her for her remarks. And um, Raquel as uh, as we, I call her, and a lot of people know her by Raquel, uh, is uh, an assistant professor of Portuguese, Spanish, and Latin America and Iberian Studies at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. And she currently serves as the president of the American Association of Teachers of Spanish and Portuguese, AATSB, and, uh, which is one of the oldest and largest um, language-specific teaching organizations in the U.S. Bem-vinda, Raquel, e por favor, com a palavra. Obrigada, boa tarde. Um, first, I would just like to thank Janish and Renato for all of their hard work in putting this event together. Uh, just share with you that it is an honor and a privilege to be here with you all today celebrating this momentous occasion and representing the American Association of Teachers of Spanish and Portuguese, or as we are affectionately known, the AATSP, 
As Hinata mentioned, we are the oldest and largest, most, most comprehensive language specific professional organization in the US. And at the heart of our mission is promoting the study and teaching of Spanish and Portuguese languages and their corresponding Hispanic and Luso Brazilian, which I really want to emphasize today, um, and other related cultures at all levels of education. So from pre K all the way through graduate school. Um, for me personally, studying in Brazil as a college student was life changing. I was in the Salvador in the state of Bahia, which is a place super rich in history, in culture, in movements, in resistance, and in the push towards independence. Um, and I just am super excited and thrilled to be here with, here with you today and looking forward to learn more through Dr. Sadler Esquino. Agradeço de coração o convite para participar deste evento. Obrigada. Muito obrigado. Uh, na realidade, uh, I know, I'll switch back to English. I have this uh, uh, habit of going automatically to Portuguese. Boom. Uh, but uh, uh, for those who are following us uh, in the various uh, communities, so I will switch back to English. Thank you so much, um, AATSP, for being part of this program um, and for all the work that is being done uh, to promote uh, Portuguese and Spanish throughout the United States. Uh, indeed, uh, we also would like to thank the Luso American Development Foundation, FLAT, from Lisbon, Portugal, for sponsoring uh, the event as well. Uh, we have the uh, privilege of having, uh, via a recorded message, uh, the uh, director, the chair of the MCLL department at California State University, Fresno. She is a professor of French uh, and French studies, and uh, Na Dr. Natalie Munoz chairs the modern and classical languages and literature department at uh, uh, Fresno State, where we have, of course, the Portuguese language that is taught, including some Something that we just inaugurated about a year ago, as Renato also has, which is, and we're all, always excited about that, and that is a minor in the Portuguese language that just began a bit uh, about a year ago. So um, let me share the screen with everyone, and we'll listen to the words of uh, our colleague and friend, Dr. Uh, Natalie Munoz. Welcome, Benvidus. On behalf of the Department of Modern and Classical Languages and Literatures and the Portuguese Beyond Borders Institute from the College of Art and Humanities at Fresno State, I want to welcome everyone to this conference commemorating the Bicentennial of the Independence of Brazil. Warm greetings to the Consul General of Brazil in San Francisco, Ambassador Aldino Sena Ganem, to the President of the American Association of Teachers of Spanish and Portuguese, Dr. Rachel Mamia Hernandez, the Dean of Extended Inter International Education from CSU Stanislaus, Dr. Kerry Knudsen Miller, the keynote speaker, Dr. Darlene Sadlier, Professor Emerita in the Department of Spanish and Portuguese at Indiana University, Bloomington. And of course, the organizers of this event, Professors Renato Aldem and Denise Borges. It is lovely to see two Portuguese programs from the CSU universities working together to bring forward such a rewarding program. Commemorating the Bicentennial of Brazil's independence is of utmost importance for our program at Fresno State, where many of our students of the Portuguese language and cultural classes are very interested in Brazil as the largest Portuguese speaking country in the world. The Portuguese language, the unique Brazilian culture, the rich history, the fabulous gastronomy, the excitement of football or soccer, and the Brazilian cinema, among many other aspects of Brazil, are essential to our students and to our valley. Fresno, the fifth largest city in California and the 10th most culturally diverse city in the US, continues to build bridges and bring the world to our students through Fresno State and other institutions. We are delighted that commemorating the Bicentennial of Brazil is yet another opportunity for our students and the rich myriad of cultures that compose our region. <clears throat> Again, on behalf of Fresno State, we welcome all the speakers and panelists. We also applaud the initiative that combines two Portuguese language programs in the Valley through CSU Fresno and CSU Stanislaus. Viva o Brasil and its vibrant culture. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, our good friend, Natalie Munoz, Professor Natalie Munoz, uh, Director 
uh, chair of the uh, uh, MCLL, the Modern and Classical Languages and Literature Department at Fresno State. So I will now turn it over to uh, Renato. Um, I don't uh, think the Dean is here yet, so we okay. can- Okay. All right, so um, I'd like, we'd like to invite now uh, Sua Excelência, uh, Mr. Aldanio Sena Ganem, the Consul General of Brazil, for his remarks. Boa tarde, Renato. Boa tarde, Professor Diniz. E boa tarde a todos. Vou falar um, umas palavras em português. É um momento de alegria para nós, de grande satisfação, de celebração dos nossos 200 anos de independência. E agora vou falar em inglês para que todos possam ouvir. Good afternoon. I would like, first of all, to thank uh, the University of California, Fresno, and Stanislas, and also the American Association of Teachers of Portuguese and Spanish, and the Fundação Luso-Americana para o Desenvolvimento for organizing this so relevant event. It's a great pleasure to be a part of it. Uh, I would like also to welcome uh, the keynote speaker, Professor Darlene Sala. As you are aware, uh, the Brazilian independence was in some way different because it was pacific in some way, and also it was uh, an agreement between Portugal and Brazil, at least uh, in the royal family and some Brazilian politicians. Uh, this, I think, that uh, launched the base for uh, not only a friendship between Brazil and Portugal, but uh, we are brothers cooperating to promote our language, our culture, our values, and so on. But Brazil is also a diversified and multicultural country. Uh, based on our ancestry, Portuguese, but also African, also indigenous, we integrate with people from all over the world. We have more Lebanese in Brazil than in Lebanon. 20 million descendants of Italy, uh, 2 million from Japan. There is a state of Brazil that part of it is German, at, at, le at least of German descent. So we are really a multicultural country. Uh, I would say that Brazil identity today is in certain way universal. That's to say a mix of people, of values, of culture from all over the world. And this is why we uh, welcome, we receive everyone with open arms. Well, I would like to thank you again and wish you a very successful event. Thank you so much for organizing it. Thank you, Mr. Adanio, and um, thank you for participating and supporting us. Thank you. And I see Carly here. Um, I would like also to invite our uh, Dr. Kari Knudsen Miller. She is the Dean of Extended and International Education here at Stan State. Uh, Dr. Knudsen and I collaborate with, as a member um, of the International Education um, Advisory Committee. Welcome, Kari. Obrigada. I'm so happy to be here and I want to first um, congratulate you all um, for being committed, for being dedicated, for being energetic, and for being activists in making sure that we have rich, fruitful, um, impactful collaborations with our higher education um, partners in Brazil. Just a second, I just lost my whole screen. There I'm back. Uh, things were flying for a moment. I, I wanna thank, um, you know, I wanna thank Arlene Jackson. Arlene Jackson was the former head of international for ASCU. So Fresno State and Stan State are both ASCU institutions. And when I was a very new senior international officer, Arlene told me, Carrie, go to Brazil. 
And, and I, you know, as a good young new professional who, you know, was thoughtful about uh, listening to folks um, in terms of guiding her career, off I went. And really with that initial encouragement of Arlene, and then it's really at each institution, I've, I've been at, at Cal State Fullerton and now Stan State, it's the faculty who have been so instrumental in, in, in the doing this well, in doing this right, in doing this with impact, in doing with this with enthusiasm. So I just returned from the European Association of International Education. This was a phenomenal experience and it was so brilliant to be back in a massive convention center in Barcelona, interacting with our um, higher ed colleagues from across the globe. And, you know, my, my, my favorite, right? You know, I, I am, I gravitate straight to the Fabai um, and the brilliant uh, Brazilian uh, delegation stand because I, I cannot wait to say hello to Jose Celso and find out what's going on now with COIL and Brazil with UNESPI now taking some leadership in Brazil, um, working to support the, you know, the COIL, um, the collaborative online experience of other institutions. So we can broaden the, the access and the opportunity to engage in dialogue, um, in conversation and action. Um, with our colleagues. So the next um, the next activity that Hanato and I will participate is going down to Brazil for Fobai. So in um, April, I believe it is, um, Fobai will be in Minas. And so that is that is our our next um, on the ground opportunity to advance um, global engagement and international exchange with our partners there. And so I welcome, you know, everyone involved in this conversation to inform, to inform the dialogue and to form what it is we go down um, to do and come back um, and continue to engage in together. So greetings from Stan State and thank you, Hanato, for your leadership in this space. Thank you very much, Kari. And you're gonna make you're gonna eat lots of pound de queijo, right? That's my trade. <laughs> I just, I went to Europe, I came back, I'm just in my day two of three days of retreats. And so the trade is, is that I get cheese bread. Okay. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Thank you. And um, now our keynote speaker, uh, Darlene Sadler, will present a woman of substance, Dona Leopoldina and Brazilian dependence. Darlene Sadler is a professor emerita in the Department of Spanish and Portuguese at Indiana University Bloomington. She's the author of many books on Brazilian Portuguese and the Lusophone African literature and culture. Among her works are the panoramic studies, Brazil Imagined 1500 to the present, in the Portuguese speaking diaspora, seven centuries of literature and the arts. Both works have been translated into Portuguese. Her most recent book, appearing just this summer, is another broad historical study, this time focusing on cinema and politics, and titled A Century of Brazilian Documentary Film From Nationalism to Protest. Her earlier books include studies of Brazilian poet uh, Cecilia Meirelles and Portuguese poet Fernando Pessoa. The first book uh, about women writers in post-revolutionary Portugal, as well as several anthologies, most notably her volume, Latin American Melodrama, Passion, Pathos and Entertainment in her book of translations titled 100 Years After Tomorrow, Brazilian Women's Fiction in the 20th Century. Professor Had, uh, Sadler was elected a lifetime foreign member of the Brazilian Academy of Letters in Rio 
in 2019 and of the Academy of Letters in Salvador, Bahia in 2021. Um, Dr. Sadler or Professor Sadler, Darlene Sadler and then Darlene, this, this was how I referred to Dr. Darlene J. Sadler in my trajectory from a graduate student to a colleague. I had the privilege to have her as my advisor for both my master's and my doctoral degrees in Portuguese at Indiana University Bloomington. Now for exact 20 years. Well, it's not a bicentennial friendship, <laughs> but two decades, uh, two decades is a respectful amount of time to share with a professional and to maintain a relationship of much learning and respect. It is my honor to introduce you to this great researcher, educator, and contributor to our Portuguese language and cultures in Portuguese. Welcome, Darlene. Muito bem-vinda. Thank you so much, Renato. Oh, it's wonderful to see you and so many uh, of your colleagues and, and the, the Council General. It's, it's, it's just wonderful to be with you. Uh, we, we've, been, we've done many events like this together in the, in the long ago past. I can't believe it's 20 years now. Um, but I have to say that I'm most honored to be um, on the dais with your, your other guests and to be offering the keynote for this uh, several days of, of uh, events. So congratulations to you and to your colleagues. And um, I'll move on to my presentation. If I can bring up the screen or will you be bringing it up? I, I think you'll need to do it. Uh, yeah. yeah, please. Just like what? Should be able to. There we go. Perfect. Great. Thank you. All right. Um, on September 2nd, 1822, Donna Maria Leopoldina, the 25 year old Austrian born princess and wife of Pedro, Prince Regent of Brazil, wrote from Rio to her husband in Sao Paulo, urging him to proclaim Brazilian independence. Brazil wants you for its monarch. With or without your support, the country will separate itself from Portugal. The apple is ripe. Pick it now before it rots. Pedro, this is the most important moment of your life. According to many historians, the same day she signed the decree for independence as princess regent, while according to historians that same day, she signed the decree for independence as princess regent while Pedro was quelling conflicts in Sao Paulo over the issue of the country's separation. Five days later on September 7, near the banks of Sao Paulo's Ipirango River, Pedro did just as Leopoldina had asked. History has given, or gives Pedro credit for Brazil's independence, but as Leopoldina's letter just quoted in her signing of the State Council's proceedings supporting independence passed, Leopoldina was the driving force behind Pedro's proclamation, which for the last two centuries has been represented by his September 7th declaration of independence or death. My talk today is about the woman of substance, not behind the man, but beside the man, whose private consultations and correspondence helped to keep the monarchy intact and the Brazilian provinces united, unlike those in Spanish America, and in the process thwarting Portugal's attempt to return Brazil to its former colonial status. What is remarkable to consider is that just six years prior to the Declaration of Independence, Leopoldina, the 19-year-old daughter of Franz I of Austria, was living in Vienna and writing to her eldest sister, Marie Louise, wife of Napoleon Bonaparte, about their father's comforting promise to name her court mineralogist as consolation for her possible future as an unmarried woman. 
being 19 year old was regarded as rather old for a woman to be single, especially a marriageable one from a royal dynasty. In the June 1816 letter, she confided to her sister Louise, and I quote, I assure you that I've already totally resigned myself to the divine will, which meaning spinsterhood. A few months later, however, she hints in another letter to her sister of a marriage contract in the works with Brazil. A few days later, she asked Louise to send her a copy of Alphonse de Beauchamp's History of Brazil, and in subsequent correspondence, mentions learning the Portuguese language while organizing her mineral collection and preparing a catalog. Leopoldina was far from the typical young female aristocrat and showed great passion for the natural sciences, especially mineralogy. In fact, part of the reciprocal arrangements in the marriage contract included a scientific mission uh, to accompany Leopoldina to Brazil. Its purpose was to explore the territory, catalog different species of plants and animals, and send samples back to Austria for study and collections in numerous uh, collections in museums and botanical gardens there. The expedition included the famous naturalists von Martius and von Spitz, whose travels took them to the Amazon. Leopoldina was born into the Habsburg line. Her father, Franz, was the last Holy Roman Emperor who proclaimed himself Emperor of Austria and repeatedly waged war against Napoleon, negotiating one particularly bitter defeat by marrying his daughter, Louise, to the Frenchman. After a short peace, Austria uh, defeated Napoleon as part of the uh, of a coalition in 1814, driving Napoleon into temporary exile in Elba. Louise did not accompany him and lived in Italy with the title of the Duchess of Parma. However, the Treaty of Fontainebleau demanded that her son be raised by his grandfather, Franz I, in Vienna. Leopoldina wrote many letters from Vienna to Louise about her son as she awaited her own destiny as the daughter of a staunch Catholic and highly conservative monarch who opposed any form of radicalism and used spies and censors to ensure his absolute sovereignty. The years immediately prior to Leopoldina's arrival in Rio in 1817 were heady ones for Brazil. In less than 10 years, the country saw the arrival of the Portuguese court which had fled Napoleon's invasion of Portugal in 1807, the opening of the country's courts, and the establishment of a national library, a bank, newspapers, among many other activities. In 1815, the Prince Regent, Don Juan, elevated Brazil to the United Kingdom of Portugal and the Algarves. And a year later, he invented, he invited a French artistic mission to create in Rio a school of fine arts. In 1816, Don Juan's son Pedro was proclaimed Prince of the United Kingdom. That event was followed by the arrival of Leopoldina in Rio in 1817 and their marriage, which was a cause for widespread celebration. Following the death of his mother, Queen Maria, Don Juan was crowned King Don Juan VI. Between 1817 and 1820, Leopoldina's abundant correspondence about life in Brazil is largely about daily activities. Horseback riding, walks in the countryside, theater going, attendance at official and religious celebrations, those kinds of activities. She writes to both her sister and her father about her love for her new husband, her appreciation and deep affection for her father-in-law, Don Juan, and the happy news that she is about to be a mother. Her letters to her father are filled with references to plants, animals, many of which she caught and killed herself, because she was uh, an outdoors woman. And she, she refers to minerals, which she sends to Austria's Nat Natural History Museum. Her work in this area is prodigious. Fruits, chocolate, a sloth's hide, and rodents are among the first items that she sends uh, back home. 
other objects follow, including rubies and topazes and tourmalines, samples of seeds, a few monkeys, 100 different kinds of birds, an Indian zebu, and an ostrich. In one letter, she refers to shipping her father a landscape by Thomas Enders, who was part of the Austrian scientific mission accompanied Leopoldina to Rio. A highly educated woman, Leopoldina was far better informed than Pedro, and her interests were broad, suggested by her request to her sister for books on topics ranging from economics and natural history to travel literature. The liberal revolution in Portugal in early 1820 resulted in the government's demand for the return of the royal court to Lisbon under new conditions prescribed by a constitutional monarch. Ina wrote to her father in Vienna in late 1820 about her concerns with Pedro's growing liberal tendencies. At the same time, she reassures, she reassures her husband of her faithfulness to his strict religious and absolutist principles. She was also preparing for Pedro to be sent back to Portugal in 1821 to meet Portugal's demand, and she wrote to her private secretary, the Austrian physician and naturalist, George von Schaefer, to prepare a ship for her to follow her husband, since she was too far along in her pregnancy to leave Rio at that time. This was her third pregnancy, her first child, Maria da Guardia, would later become Maria II and Queen of Portugal. Her second child, Miguel, died shortly after birth. The following month, Don Juan announced his decision to return to Portugal, leaving Pedro as Prince Regent in Brazil. Interestingly, also decreed that should Don Juan uh, decreed that should Pedro die after he returned, after he, meaning Bonjour, returned to Lisbon, Leopoldina would assume the regency, sign of his absolute faith and trust in her abilities to rule. There is a sense of oscillating political sympathies in Leopoldina's letters after Don Juan's departure of Portugal. In June 1821, she writes her sister Louise about her concern the constitutional spirit taking hold in Brazil although she confesses having liberal sentiments herself, just not as liberal, as liberal as those in Brazil. A month later, she writes to her aunt, Maria Amelia, about the, and I quote, sad circumstances of the general spirit of independence has inundated them. But to her secretary Schaefer, she confides that Pedro is well disposed to liberals in Brazil but not as decided as she would like him to be. Soon she writes to Louise that they are remaining in Brazil contrary to the demand of the Portuguese courts and that she hopes to move Pedro to declare Brazil's independence. She describes her efforts to this end as costly since remaining in Brazil means continued separation from her sister and family in Europe. Writing to the Marquis of Marialva, Portugal's ambassador to Vienna, who had arranged for marriage to Pedro, she self-identifies perhaps for the first time as a Brazilian. It's important to note that she used her pregnancy that spring to delay and ultimately defy the Portuguese court's demand that they leave Brazil. Her correspondence with her father is especially interesting. In June 1822, she reassures him that despite the spirit of independence and her husband's growing liberal sentiments, she remains faithful to her father's religious and political beliefs. Leopoldina seems to be hedging bets on what might happen in Brazil when she asks her father for the promised post of court mineralogist were it necessary for her to return with her children to Austria. But by August, she informs him that Don Juan's rule has been limited under Portugal's constitutional monarchy and that she and Pedro are definitely staying in Brazil, which she describes, and these are her words, beautiful and a beautiful and prosperous realm, which could never be subjugated to Europe. Most importantly, she asked him to use his power and influence to support her decision. She is more direct and enthusiastic with the Marquis of Mayalva. She writes, 
Brazil is too big, powerful, and knowing its political force, incapable of being a colony of the Portuguese court. And for that reason, it will cost many and more difficult and bloody battles. Despite growing conflicts between Brazilian patriots and Portuguese troops faithful to the king, she writes a family matters in sending Louise a natural history collection, African and Brazilian bracelets, and portraits of her two daughters. She also announces she is pregnant again. This will be a motif throughout my talk. A few days later, she informs her aunt she is, temp she is a temporarily in charge of the government while Pedro negotiates peace in Sao Paulo, stating, and these are her words, it is the greatest sacrifice I could make for him and for Brazil. Among Pedro's counselors to whom Leopoldina looked for support and guidance were Jose Bonifacio, Minister of Foreign Affairs, and the priest, Francisco Sampaio, who collaborated with Bonifacio in urging Pedro to declare Brazil's independence. Leopoldina's letters to Bonifacio show her intent to protect Brazil from possible enemies, including a governor, whom she describes as Pedro Chumbu, a pro Portugal proponent, a possible spy by the name of Augusto Brandt, as well as her local councilman, and, and these are her words, certain white men who carried her correspondence. For that reason, she added in a letter to Bonifacio, one letter to Bonifacio, that she chose a black man as her courier. I should add that Leopoldina was what one might describe as a proto abolitionist. Working long days with her ministers while in charge of the country, Leopoldina met in late August with representatives of a Bahian woman assembly who presented her with a letter signed by 186 of their constituency to thank Leopoldina for her support of the independence movement. Writing to Pedro, Leopoldina referenced the meeting, stating that her position was, and I quote, proof that women were more spirited and greater adherence to the good cause. But just days after the women's visit, 600 Portuguese soldiers entered Bahia to staunch that good cause. Leopoldina immediately wrote Pedro on August 29th, urging him to return to Rio because Brazilian soldiers in Bahia failed to move against the Portuguese troops and the situation was causing an uproar in Rio. On September 2nd, Leopoldina presided over a meeting of the State Council, which included her friend Bonifacio, and she signed the proceedings in support of independence. In addition to Leopoldina's letter of September 2nd, urging Pedro to declare independence, Bonifacio sent his own letter to Don Pedro, stating, and he wrote, I advise your highness to stay and make Brazil a happy realm, separate from Portugal, instead of a slave to the despotic courts that it is today. He also refers to Leopoldina's letter and her own desire to break with Portugal. Those letters reached Don Pedro on September 7th, the day he proclaimed Brazil's independence. He replaced the historic royal, royal colors of blue and white on the flag with green, the color of the House of Braganza, and Pedro's family crest. Upon his return to Rio, he added yellow, the color of the Austrian Habsburg crest, to Harold mm -hmm. Leopoldina as his partner in life in the declaring of independence. On September 24th, Pedro was acclaimed Emperor of Brazil. He was 24 years old. One month later, on October 12th, Pedro's birthday, Leopoldina was acclaimed Empress of Brazil. He was 25 and newly pregnant with their daughter, Paula, following the birth and death of a son in 1821 and the birth of a daughter, Januaria, in March 1822. Among Leopoldina's concerns after independence was the education of her daughters, especially the eldest, Maria de Gloria, who would assume the title of Maria II and Queen of Portugal in 1826 when she was just seven years old. Another preoccupation was money. Leopoldina's 
financial resources having dwindled follow the return of Joao VI to Portugal with most of the Brazilian treasure. A third concern was the relationship with her father and securing political and commercial ties between the newly independent Brazil and Austria. Between 1825, when her son Pedro was born, who would become, who would become Pedro II at Leopoldina's death in 1826 at the age of 29, she also had to contend with the presence of her husband's lover, Domitila de Castro, whom he met in 1822 and installed as a lady in waiting, wait, a lady in waiting in his wife's court. In December, two months after independence, Leopoldina writes to her father asking him to recognize the Brazilian independence as the only way to resist the popular spirit of republicanism. A few months later, she writes of erroneous and mischievous information conveyed to him and corrects the record, stating that independence thwarted not only republicanism, but also anarchy. One of her main objects objectives in this letter is to pique her father's commercial interests. And she wrote, Brazil's great greatness is of supreme importance for European powers. And the major desire of the courtiers to sign commercial contracts with Austrian possessions in Italy and establish a commercial monopoly in their ports for the extraordinary and colorful Brazilian woods and colonial merchandise, which would be extremely advantageous for my beloved country. The second objective was to gain her father's recognition of independence. She wrote, now nothing is left for me to wish except that you, dear father, assume the role of our true friend and ally. It will certainly be one of the happiest days of my, for my husband and myself when we have gained that certainty. She used a similar wording in a second letter written that day to Baron von Strummer an American diplomat, I'm sorry, an Austrian diplomat, asking him to act as mediator in securing her father's support of the new empire. In September 1823, she writes to her sister that she has no one in whom to confide, not even her husband, an indication of Pedro's disaffection and her growing isolation in the court as a, as a foreign monarch. This despite her vital role in assuring Brazil's independence and professing her total allegiance as a Brazilian. She also continued to write her family, urging Austria's recognition of Brazil. Here's an image of the two women, Leopoldina on the left and Domitila on the right. If the women of Bahia brought Leopoldina comfort and reassurance prior to Pedro's proclamation of independence, the English woman, Maria Graham, a sea captain's widow, amateur botanist, and an author of travel books, provided the empress with a modicum of solace after 1822. Living in Rio since 1821 as part of the British community there, Graham was hired to tutor Leopoldina's eldest, the Princess Maria de Gloria. In 1823, following a trip to England to prepare for her pupil's tutelage, Graham returned to Rio in September of 1824, a few months after US recognition of Brazil, the first nation to do so. Her residence in the palace, however, was short-lived, owing mainly to court intrigue. Nonetheless, Graham remained in, in Rio and frequently corresponded with Leopoldina, the latter responding with letters expressing dismay at her dear friend's dismissal but her consolation that Graham had decided to stay in Rio for a time. In a November 1824 letter, she writes to Graham, and I quote, I confess, but only to you, that I will shout praise to the Lord when I have been freed of certain scoundrels. A few months later, she writes to her friend for books about Portuguese literature and documents on Christopher Columbus. In her request, Leopoldina bitterly refers to herself as, quote, the one who was exported to this country of ignorance. Independent Brazil relied upon its recognition by European states, especially Portugal, the latter reluctant to 
because of Brazil's economic difficulties. A stalemate between the two countries seemed insurmountable, with Brazil insisting it would not negotiate unless Brazil first recognized its independence, while Portugal refused to negotiate until Brazil recognized Portugal's sovereignty. In 1823, Rio looked to England, Portuguese longtime ally, to mediate and even offered to end the slave trade if recognition were secured. England's interest was both political and economic. Primary was retaining the monarchy in Brazil as a counterbalance to republicanism in the Americas. Mediation was long and complicated by demands of both sides and negotiators came and went. One of the sticking points was Don Juan's desire to be named emperor of Brazil and return Pedro to the position of regent. In January 1825, the Portuguese government sent the British diplomat Sir Charles Stewart as its official negotiator. His large archive contains two original letters from Maria Graham and two copies of letters from Pedro and Leopoldina. This archive is, uh, is part of an impressive Braziliana collection in the Lilly Library's rare book and manuscripts collection here at Indiana University. And I, and I urge students, faculty to come to Indiana to see this wonderful, wonderful library and the many, many wonderful archives we have that pertain to both Brazil and Portugal. Leopoldina's correspondence during the negotiating period reveals a once resolute woman proactive in the independence movement, increasingly struggling with personal issues. In a letter to her sister Louise in December 1824, she alludes to the political limbo of her adopted country, but mostly writes about nature walks in the countryside, which seem her only solace. She ends the letter saying, and I quote, thanks to God, I still do not find myself in an interesting state, or estado interessante, a euphemistic phrase for being pregnant. She was also dealing with financial difficulties. After arranging for Germans to emigrate to Brazil, she writes to her former secretary Schaefer, now Pedro's charge d'affaires in Germany, to send her money approved by Pedro for her recruiting efforts. Maria Graham and Leopoldina continued their correspondence even after Graham left Brazil. Despite her gradual displacement in Pedro's affections, Leopoldina looked to Graham and her eyes unattainable in Brazil to scale to weigh her precious stones and other minerals. Here in Brazil, Brazil has received correspondence from friends in Ireland and arranged for passage back to England. Just prior to Graham's departure, he writes of, forgive, of giving her two parrots to take with her as well as other presents. Graham mentions the Leopoldina in the last century in the last century. It looks like you're having up. Oh, yes, some. The last century. Yes. Uh, Darlene, I don't know if you can hear me, but um, it looks like we lost your we lost your connection and we can't hear you or see you. Um, I wonder if you can try to log in, or it might usually Zoom does that, right? It, it automatically brings the person back. I'm not sure if she, if she can hear us and. Yeah, I don't think she can. Um, I think her it was starting to go off, and then it completely kicked her out. I believe, uh, except she had already shared, so we still have part of the presentation. I don't know if she'll be able to come back. We'll see. Mm -hmm. Let's see if I can send her a message here. Okay. Uh, Stuart, ah, yeah, there here it she is. is. Oh, here oh, she is. Oh, oh. 
this is, this is okay. the great challenge of technology. Okay, here we go. Eu não posso ver ainda. I can see it. You can? Yes. Ok. Yeah, estamos a ver, não estamos a ouvi-lo, não estamos a ver. We're okay. We, yeah, we can okay. see it, but we cannot, we cannot hear again uh, Darlene. She was there, and then all of a sudden she was back to, I think that her um, internet connection must have got. Let me try something here, but I can't bring, I can't do anything else, unfortunately. Yeah. Okay, yeah, we have we have lost her completely. Well, it was it was so it was being a fascinating presentation. I mean, I was uh, enjoying it uh, immensely, and um, hopefully we can bring her right back. I think she's just about finished. She only had about uh, four more slides to go, so hopefully she'll be able to connect. Uh, sometimes we hear a lot about Don Pedro, but we don't hear a lot about uh, uh, Marie Leopoldina, and uh, and uh, and of course we hear about Don Juan. And his love uh, for Brazil, he'd rather have not gone back. Uh, he may have not been for the independence, but he certainly loved uh, Brazil uh, to the point that he really did not want to go back to Portugal, as all of the uh, documents indicate. Um, and so we're waiting to see if we can get uh, Professor uh, Darlene back on. Um, uh, ask the, uh, the, uh, the, if, while we wait uh, just a few uh, more seconds, if we can get her on, um, I would uh, like to ask the um, uh, Ambassador Consul General of uh, Brazil in San Francisco, um, the, uh, the, the independence, the bicentennial is, seems like it's uh, being a big celebration in Brazil and the Brazilian communities. How important do you see this, Mr. Ambassador, as a as, a, as an important event, obviously, 200 years of independence of Brazil, um, uh, this, uh, this country that is the powerhouse of Latin America and this hemisphere as well. Um, how is the, the independence, how do you see it in the home country and in a Brazilian diaspora as well? Well, as uh, you saw, there were many celebrations in Brazil. And of course, it's a very relevant date for us. Uh, we have also been celebrated abroad, not exactly on September 7, for example, here in, uh, today we have this uh, very interesting workshop. Uh, we will have here in San Francisco and we'll be inviting you uh, a concert by the, the uh, Youthful uh, Orchestra Symphony from Wine County. In December 17, with a Brazilian composers celebrating 200 years and also a cocktail, a reception, and so on. All over the world, the, the, the embassies, the consulates are celebrating not only on September 7, but all over of the year. Yeah, I think the, the bicentennial should continue at least until the 201, right? So we have yes. a whole year to continue to. Uh, to to uh, to commemorate uh, um, and, uh, and 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 this history that Professor Alain was giving us, you know, sometimes uh, in in the world we see, you know, um, as she pointed out in the beginning, it wasn't just Don Pedro. There was this all of Maria Leopoldina and everyone else. There was there was kind of a a a push even for Pedro to assume this responsibility. Exactly. This is why I, I said that. Uh, it was in some way different. Of course, there were, there were some conflicts, some different views, and uh, Professor Darlene explained very well. I learned a lot today, many details that I didn't know, but it was different in some way that the royal family uh, certainly agreed, the, the, the royals agreed of, uh, uh, on the independence of Brazil, and also some politicians that were uh, agreed on, on having, a, let's say, a peaceful transition, uh, even though we had some conflicts, especially in Bahia, but uh, it, there was not a war for independence, uh, as you have seen in many other countries, including in, in the, the South America with Bolivar and other revolutionaries uh, leading the war for independence. 
there was seems to be a movement, and of course historians have debated this, um, that there was within the royal families of Europe um that there was the need for brazil to be a monarchy and not go into a republican form of government such as the united states and other latin american countries how how, how do you see this i mean there was it was a really commitment there uh and it happened for a few years it didn't happen for a, a very long time but it did yeah. it did continue that brazil has this uniqueness that it was created as a monarchy that's true well, it lasted many decades, I would say, yeah. until 89. So it's, we are talking about almost 17 years. It was in certain ways that demonstrates a certain instability, let's say. And I think that this was possible exactly because it was in some way agreed the independence. It was not like the, the, the other countries in South America and North America. Indeed, and indeed, it did last quite a few years, and it was, um, uh, as you said, it, it it seemed like it served as a way for, it, although there was some conflict, but it wasn't a bloody as some other regions of, and some other countries, and brought the stability and and the and the connections that uh, Brazil needed as a young country with yes. the European powers, you know, uh, obviously for trade and for uh, political clout and everything else. Exactly. Uh, let's say from a historic point of view, I think this was a benefit, an advantage uh, for Brazil having this kind of stability for almost 70 years mm -hmm. instead of uh, having, uh, let's say, a war revolution and difficulties that other countries had in the beginning. Thank you so much, Mr. Ambassador, uh, for sure. taking this time. And uh, Renato, I don't think that Professor Darlene can come back, uh, if I'm not mistaken. So um, we're going to, unless you have other information for us, um, I want to thank all of those who are following us here, those of us who, those who are following in all the different groups, there were 38 groups on uh, on social media that, uh, that uh, were able to share it. And we appreciate that because that is how we can uh, celebrates uh, in, uh, in in numbers this very important um, date for Brazil, but I would say for Portugal certainly as well, for all the Portuguese-speaking countries throughout the world, and for the world itself. You know, um, Brazil uh, continues to fascinate all of us, uh, whether we are Portuguese background or not. Um, as uh, as my colleague uh, Natalie said, through the music, through the culture through of course soccer that most of my students follow more than i do and uh, and of course uh, through uh, through the portuguese language if it wasn't for brazil Portu portuguese certainly would not be uh, the fifth most spoken language in the world it'd be down quite a few notches so uh, thank you so much uh, mr ambassador and not to win in you thank you goodbye goodbye thank you so much thank you mr ambassador Denise? Think uh -huh. um, uh, it looks like I saw the uh, Professor Sadler raised her hand here. Okay, she is back on. Okay, yeah. fantastic. And, Great, um, we can bring her back then. That's nice. Thank you. Let's, uh -huh. Thank you for doing that. Okay, so here we are. And that way we can finish her fascinating presentation. And uh, you're back on, Professor. Meanwhile, we were able to have a fascinating conversation with the ambassador, with with the consul general. Thank you so much. Let me let me unmute. I, I have no idea what happened. That's okay. His things I was happen. Talking and I noticed everybody was frozen. And I <laughs> um, so uh, if you'd like me, I only have a page or two left. If you'd like me to finish. Oh, I would. We yes. do. We would. Okay, we, great. Would, we we are here. We will <laughs> not leave until you finish. <laughs> and, and I need to do a. And, and we'll need to and, to, and we'll need to make you co. Uh, we'll also, uh, yeah, let me make you uh, also again the um, co hosts. Uh, you should be able to share right now, Professor. Okay. I think Thank what so happened much. is that my PowerPoint also went out. So I need to see if I can bring that back up. Just a we second. Should, yeah, you should be able to do so right now. Yeah. Minimize. I think there's something amiss going on. I'm not sure where it is, but I'm just going to finish reading. 
and I'm not quite sure where things left off, but I'll, I'll just, you could still hear me. Can you? We can, yeah. we can, and we okay, have you, great. we have you, we have you as hosts, so you should be okay, able great. to change. If, well, yeah, let me like just, it. let me just say that, and, and forgive me if I'm repeating myself, but I'm, I was referring to the Stewart archive that has mm -hmm. letters, and I don't know if, I, I began reading the letter that Pedro wrote to his father. Um, so I'm not sure, but I'll just, once again, he says, I received, he writes to Don Juan, he says, I received your letter of May 23rd, uh, cre um, uh, crediting Stewart as the plenipotentiary and expressing the wish that I treat him with that distinction. Great was my pleasure. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> Great was my pleasure at the receipt of your letter and still greater was it when I learned that Stuart was authorized to negotiate for the recognition of the Brazilian empire's independence. The usual exchange of powers between the negotiators having taken place, the negotiations commenced and we were brought to conclusion on August 29th in a treaty signed on the same day and ratified by me the following morning and by which it was agreed that Brazil should pay in the form of therein 2 million pounds sterling from which you are now at liberty to take uh, 250,000 pounds. Your majesty will observe that on my part, I have done nothing, I have done everything in my power and, and that in this treaty, peace has been made by me. Your ratification will show the entire world your love for peace and for a son who has assented to your royal pretensions, conceding by the present treaty points not unknown to your majesty of much difficulty and of great delicacy. There is kind of an interesting little uh, hint there. I, my father, feel so convinced to ratify the treaty, for I know the docility and the dignity of your heart and your love of peace, that on September 7th, 1825, I shall publish the treaty and consider myself recognized by your majesty and the most perfect harmony established between the Portuguese and Brazilian nations. Consult, sir, your royal heart it will tell you to support the royalty in America for your own interests independent of those relations which should exist between a father and son, both sovereigns. Lose not, sir, the opportunity of rendering yourself more illustrious in the eyes of the world and the glory of being proclaimed not only by the Portuguese, but also by Brazilians as the generous Don Juan VI. Okay, that's his letter. On that same day, Leopoldina also wrote to Don Juan, her much beloved father-in-law, about her concern for the survival of the monarch. And she wrote, my august father, the great pleasure for me is after so much time to be able to send to your majesty my respectful sentiments. Let me also beg your majesty in this letter to be the angel of peace by ratifying the treaty and in this way, showing the entire world the most generous father and extinguishing once and for all the democratic system that has held sway until now and with such fervor in this beautiful hemisphere. With the treaty, Pedro retained his status as heir to the Portuguese throne and Don Juan succeeded in recouping financial losses incurred with Brazil's expropriation of lands and funds of Portuguese who fled back to Lisbon. Although the treaty was also to ensure the abolition of the slave trade in Brazil, that point was dropped from the negotiations. Don Juan likely was aware of his son's infatuation with and elevation of Domitila as discountess. In a bold statement to ratify the treaty, um, uh, in a bold statement of his enduring affection, respect, and appreciation of Leopoldina, Juan waited to ratify the treaty until November 15th, the holiday associated with Saint Leopold the patron saint of Austria for whom Leopoldina was named. Earlier in 1825, he signed other documents relating to the negotiations on January 22nd, which was her birthday, and on October 12th, the day of her marriage to Pedro. Two months after the final ratification, Leopoldina gave birth to her son, Pedro, who would succeed his father as emperor and was to be Brazil's last reigning monarch. The year before her death on December 11, 1826, Leopoldina suffered hard losses. In March, her much adored father-in-law, Don Juan, died in Lisbon 
and her seven-year-old daughter, Maria, was sent there by Pedro to succeed him as Queen of Portugal. Her letters to her sister, Maria Graham, contain references to a dark melancholy. She was pregnant again and frequently ill. Small happiness came in the form of books sent by Graham and the set of scales to weigh her minerals. In late November, Pedro named her interim regent again as he traveled south, where war with the United Provinces of the Rio de la Plata over the colony of Sacramento were being, was being waged. Just two weeks later, sick and in and out of consciousness, she miscarried and died. The nation mourned. She was buried at the Ajuda Convent in Rio. In 1911, her remains were transferred to Rio's St. Anthony Convent. In 1954, they were moved to Sao Paulo to lie in a crypt in the Monument to Brazilian Independence, a most fitting resting place for a woman who did her utmost to ensure her adopted country's independence. So it, there was a little intervallo there, but, <laughs> but, um, it's a, but we were able to continue. Story. Thank you so much. Yeah, we were able to continue and actually have, uh, as I said, an interesting conversation um, uh, during that interval uh, with the Consul General, <laughs> the Ambassador. Uh, and so um, thank you so much. It was a fascinating, fascinating talk. Uh, we, uh, I personally learned a lot about Don Leopoldina that I did not know. Uh, and, uh, and I'm sure that all of those following us did as well. Renato? Yeah, thank you, darling. That was, that was so great. And it's, it's so interesting that Actually, in Brazil, I recall we had a, there was a soap opera about uh, mm -hmm. um, a Marquesa de Santos, yes. about Domitila, but not um, about Dona Leopold Leopoldina, mm -hmm. and that caught my attention. Like, mm -hmm. why would you know such a powerful woman would be you know let out, and they would bring? I don't know if it it was for the audience to you know what targeted. Um, you know, I think I think she, you know, she just overwhelmed. Uh, Pedro put her first, and um, uh, as you know, as I I think it was obvious, Leopoldina was was busy. You know, if not walking through the countryside, then she was having children, and she had so many, and, and of course, several of them died. Um, but she she is a fascinating figure. I mean, a, a, a real, you know, intellectual. And uh, it's, it's, you know, in great part because of her that Pedro was moved to uh, proclaim independence. And all, and all that diplomacy that she was, you know, uh, articulating, you know, yeah. kind of That's behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. yeah. And also, you know, balancing things with her father, who was, you know, a, an absolutist. So, you know, to say, you know, okay, but with the independence, at least we had brought, avoided republicanism. Um, and then, of course, trying to, uh, you know, attract him to, to recognize Brazil by talking about economic matters, of course. You know. but, but, but the Stewart archive here is a fascinating archive and, and, and contains, um, the documents that, uh, uh, about his negotiations uh, between Brazil and Portugal. It is a huge uh, archive, and I don't think very well explored. Yeah, I just, oh, if I wanted to make a comment that I, I loved uh, your presentation and I learned so much um, not only about her historical role, but I love the way you humanized her as a woman, you know, and in her bringing in her interests and also the struggles she had, um, you know, childbearing and ultimately um, passing away. And um, in mentioning the Stuart archive, it was just a curiosity of mine because I had no idea that that was housed um, at Indiana State University. So I, I was wondering if you knew how that collection had had become part of the um, university. I'm not quite sure how how the Stuart collection was acquired. There, a lot of the Brasiliana, let's say, 
um, belonged originally to a man by the name of, who was a Colombian by the name of Bernardo Mendel. And Mendel uh, donated his huge collection to the Lowy Library. Um, with, with, there was a little proviso. He, I think he and his wife remains, probably ashes are interred uh, in the library. Um, uh, but he was a huge supporter of the library and I, they probably came through him. Although the library acquired, you know, we have many other uh, sort of archives that have to do with Brazil and Portugal that came from other people. Um, recently, the archive of my um, senior colleague who studied with uh, Itor Martins, um, who gave his most valuable rare book collection uh, to the library. So, which is, you know, Brazil and Portuguese, mostly Brazilian, but also many Portuguese uh, first editions. So we've been lucky over the years to acquire, continue to acquire uh, materials. And once again, there are fellowships and for people who do projects at the Lily. So uh, I like, always like to talk about that. That's wonderful. <laughs> and, and you have a publication about some, um, uh, specifically about the Lily Library for part of the I collection. Have, yeah. When, they, when Indiana, um, we're talking about bicentennial celebrations, Indiana celebrated its bicentennial a couple of years ago. And um, because I've done a lot of research in the Lilly Library, I decided I was going to, I, I wanted to do something uh, to, call, to call attention to the Lilly. And I wrote a book called, um, uh, it's the Lilly Library, um, Intriguing Objects in a World-Class Collection. And so it sort of ranges widely, uh, but it's, it's uh, organized as an ABC. So, and there are some, obviously there are some items that with Brazil and Latin America and Portugal, but it, it, it's just very broad in what I talk about. We have some new, very unusual things, objects in the life. A lot of hair, believe it or not. Wow, I'm gonna have to go to Indiana someday. Yeah, we have that. We have at least two locks of Edgar Allan Poe's hair. The oldest hair in the collection is of Simone Bolivar. Wow. We have a lock of his hair, yeah, with a letter that sh it, 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 where you have the provenance of the lock. So yes, it's 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 a it's a, it's a real uh, treasure trove and and fascinating. Estás estás em silêncio, Renato. Nós não te ouvimos. Okay. Ah, yeah. I got to see. For some, yeah, for some reason I. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, mas obrigado, Darlene. Muito obrigado pela por, por essa apresentação tão so interesting, so intriguing. And uh, as Raquel mentioned, uh, you know, for humanizing this woman, who you know, it's part of the history, but it's part of our soul as free people. Free Brazilians, and I'll thank you very much for- well, You're very welcome. And, and I'm just very, very honored to have uh, opened the, uh, your, your conference. And um, I, 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 once again, I'm not quite sure what happened on the, on the computer, but I'm, I'm delighted that I was able to finish. Yes, yeah. and we are too. We had to know what That's happened good. to her. <laughs> yes, we did. <laughs> Thank you so much. It was a fascinating presentation. It, it, it was our honor on behalf of Fresno State and CSU Stanislaus to have you. Um, we appreciate it very, very much, your outstanding work. And you've certainly also uh, sparked our curiosity uh, on all of the wonderful archives that you have there and, and getting a couple of graduate students to do some, uh, so, so, some interesting projects on behalf of uh, 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 and using those archives. So thank you so much. Appreciate it immensely. Thank you. Thank you. And I think we're going to thank uh, everyone and in the program. Just a couple of uh, brief announcements, as Renato promised in the beginning that I would. And so um, we continue at the always at four o'clock Pacific time. 
Uh, for those of you that are following us, we have folks following us in different parts of the country. So it's at four o'clock Pacific time. Um, it will we'll come back on Friday, the 23rd. We're going to be covering the arts. Uh, we have actually um, uh, poets uh, and writers from different parts of the uh, Portuguese speaking world commemorating this uh, uh, special bicentennial. So the first parts uh, will be with some poets um, that are from different parts, uh, some writers from different parts of the Portuguese speaking world. Ernesto Muambo from Mozambique, Luis Felipe Sarmento from Portugal, Nifa Pereiras from Brazil, Rosa Angelina Batista from the United States, a Brazilian that lives in Florida, and Vera Duarte from Cabo Verde that has a very strong connection with Brazil. And then the second part of the program on Friday will be the Portuguese Language Museum in Sao Paulo, and uh, Maria Libanos, director, uh, technical director for the museum, will be giving us a fascinating presentation about uh, the museum um, uh, that will be, so we'll be focusing on the arts and language on the 23rd. We come back on the 27th next week, Tuesday and Wednesday, also at four o'clock. We have two presentations on the 27th uh, in the realm of anthropology. And then on the 28th, we have a, a, a panel dedicated to the Brazilian diaspora in California with uh, representation from Southern California, from Central California, and from Northern California. And so three different folks, one from the Los Angeles area, one from the Central San Joaquin Valley, uh, who was my student and a brilliant young man, uh, and uh, also from the Northern California as well. And we'll end it uh, with an artist that lives in the Bay Area with some Brazilian music uh, way to end this commemoration. So thank you all for joining us. Uh, thank you again, Professor. Thank you, Rachel. Also, Professor Rachel, for your presentation and your work on behalf of the association. Uh, thanks to Ambassador, uh, Consul General of Brazil in San Francisco. And of thank course, you. my good friend, Renato, thank you for being part of this. And uh, good evening, everyone. Take care. Ciao. We'll see yeah. you next time. Indeed. Thank you. It was an honor. Thank Ciao. you. Bye-bye. Ciao. Bye. Ciao. Bye. Ciao.